We've talked about control charts before when we talked about our basic quality tools in Six Sigma, but we didn't take a careful look at what control charts are, how they're put together, and how to interpret them. So in this lecture, we'll talk about the concept of the control chart method, how these things actually work. We'll look at the basic features on a control chart, and then we'll talk about how different types of variation impact process control. If you remember, a control chart is a graphical tool used to determine the state of process control. So this gives you a visual representation of your data as seen here. So it's easier to look at this data visually and determine our state of process control or monitor our process quality than if we have a big table of numbers and we have to guess, okay, are we near our average, are we far away from it? We can put these together for variables or for attributes. Variables are things like temperature or pressure or weight. They are numerical measurements that basically have infinite variation in them. Attributes are more go, no go things. So number of defects per sample, for example. For variables, we have two main control chart types, which are shown here. We have our X bar or average charts. These are also called Schuert charts. And we have our range or R bar charts. So this shows us how close we are to the process average and how big our range is. We need different types of control charts for attributes and we'll talk about those later on. Right now we'll focus on control charts for variables. Regardless of what type of control chart you have, they all have basic features. So our subgroup or our sample number, a subgroup is a collection of samples, is posted on the x-axis. The average of those subgroups is posted on the y-axis. Our process average is shown by this black line, and that's the average that's coming out of our process. It's not necessarily the average we want. So keep that in mind that your process may not be able to do what you want it to do. Or it may be able to do what you want it to do, but you don't have your different parameters set properly, so you get the average out that you want. Here in the orange lines, you can see your upper warning limit and your lower warning limit. When you get outside of those lines, that means your process control may be in trouble. Your process may be unstable. So you want to pay careful attention to your process when you're seeing things outside your upper warning limit or your lower warning limit. When your data gets outside your upper action limit or your lower action limit, that's when you actually need to take action. You might want to take action when you're above your upper warning limit or below your lower warning limit, depending on the um, strictness of your process standards. But when you're outside the action limits, then you do need to do something because your process is what we call out of control at that point. You're not near your process average and your process is producing product that's likely out of spec. Taking a look at these plus three SEs, plus two SEs, minus two SEs, and minus three SEs. That's actually how these lines are calculated. So SE stands for standard error, and that's the standard error of your process. It's a statistical term that we'll take a more close look at later, but basically your upper action limit is three times the standard error of your process. So as you can imagine, the bigger variation is in your process, the bigger your standard error is going to be, the more spread you have in your data, and so the further your action limit lines are going to be from your process average. Keep in mind that your action limits and your warning limits have nothing to do with your specification limits. So sometimes you may set your action limits plus or minus three times the standard deviation of your process and set your specification limits to the same thing. But just remember that just because you have an action limit at a certain location, that does not mean your specification limit, what you want to come out of your process, is the same thing. So when we're talking about where our limits are and how far they are from our process average, we're talking about variation that's 
either inherent to our process or that has some kind of cause. So variation that are from chance causes, we talked about those in the previous lecture, they fluctuate in a somewhat natural and expected manner. For example, using your oven at home. If you set it to 350 Fahrenheit, it's not going to stay at 350 Fahrenheit. It's going to fluctuate a little bit above, a little bit of below, because the heat control in your oven will keep kicking the heat on and off depending on what it's measuring. So it's going to oscillate a little bit, but it should stay around 350. And that's natural variation. Assignable causes are much larger in magnitude than your chance causes, and they're also unexpected. This would be if you set your oven to 350 and your actual temperature was at 380. So for this, there's some kind of identifiable cause of this unexpected variation. Maybe you bump the temperature not by mistake. Maybe the thermocouple that's measuring the temperature in your oven is broken and not reading properly. But there's some kind of cause that you can point to to say, this is what caused my variation. If we take another example, these cookies here, the ones that aren't burnt, the difference in color in them that's a chance cause, and there's just a little bit of color fluctuation here. The much darker ones have an assignable cause. These are burnt. So when you burn cookies, the color gets a lot darker. So even though there's a little bit of variation in the burnt color, we can see there's a clear difference between the properly cooked cookies and the burnt cookies. And that is our assignable cause, is burning. When we have only chance causes present, we have natural variation only, we say our process is in statistical control. And your control chart would look something like this. Everything is near the process average, we're within our warning limits, and we're definitely within our action limits. So we say this is in statistical control. Keep in mind, the process still may not be producing product in specification. Specification is different than control. So you may have a process that's perfectly in control and still producing out of spec product because your process is just not able to meet your upper and lower specification limits. When you have some kind of assignable cause in variation, we call that out of control. So these points here that are outside our warning limit and outside our action limit and maybe even this point here and this point here, because they're sort of close to our warning lines, those most likely have some kind of assignable cause that cause our process to deviate away from the average. So this is how we start to use control charts with our other process data to say, oh, okay, this point here is clearly out of control. We need to figure out what happened when we were taking that data to figure out what's causing this variation in our process, and how to bring our process back into control and get all of our points clustered around our average. Later on, we'll take a look at how to put these charts together and how to identify certain patterns that can also show up that tell us something about process control. But when you have a point that's outside of your action limits, like here, or outside of your warning limits, here, then we know that our process is beginning to go out of control and we need to do something to bring it back into control.